Good morning. Welcome on this second Sunday of Easter. The church celebrates the season of Easter. It's 50 days long, sometimes known as the Great 50 Days. So through this time, we sing the Easter music and we hear uh, the scriptures of resurrection and new life. I want to welcome those who may be visiting this morning. Uh, there is a time of refreshments and conversation after church. Uh, everyone is invited to that. I want to uh, welcome those who are joining us via Eastlink TV, because you too are part of this congregation. I see that there are some snowbirds uh, back this morning, which is a good sign. It means that winter must be coming to an end. So we're glad to see you because you're you, and also because you may be a harbinger of better days. I have a sympathy announcement. We extend our sympathy to Roger and Margaret MacArthur on the death of Roger's brother Warren in London, Ontario. And in birthday announcements, Kate Scantlebury will be eight years old on April the 13th. I think Kate was one of the first baptisms I did when I came to Trinity in 2007. Charlie Ross will be 10 years old on April the 16th. And Roger Gordon will celebrate his birthday on April the 17th. And Pearl Tomlinson will be 95 years old on April the 17th, and she's part of our Eastlink congregation. And the UCW general meeting is tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Judy Irwin will be showing slides and speaking about the 150th anniversary year. The study group on C.S. Lewis uh, continues on Monday night. We will be looking at uh, Lewis's mere Christianity. Committee meetings this week, outreach, uh, Monday at 7 p.m., pastoral care Wednesday at 5.30 p.m., and property on Wednesday at 7 p.m. This is a community announcement. There will be a workshop on the basic income guarantee at the Murphy Center uh, on Thursday of this week at 6.30 p.m. Also at the Murphy Center and also at 6.30, the Holocaust Remembrance Service. The speaker will be Beatrice Linsel. During World War II, her family lived in Holland and hid a Jewish family of four. And then finally, a reminder of the congregational meeting, which is going to be held next Sunday after church. This is an important meeting at which members of uh, the uh, discernment committee will be elected and the terms of reference for the discernment committee will be presented to you for approval. So I hope that people will uh, make an effort uh, to attend this meeting. As I say, it will be immediately after church and the refreshments which would normally be in the gym will be brought up here. So you don't have to worry about where you're going to get your coffee. This is the day that God has made.
Once there was a person who said such wonderful things and did such marvelous things that people began to follow him. One day they asked, who are you? He answered them, I am the light. We sing of Jesus raised from the dead. We sing hallelujah. In Jesus' life, teaching, and self-offering. God empowers us to live from love. In Jesus' crucifixion. God bears the sin, grief, and suffering of In Jesus' resurrection. God overcomes death. Nothing separates us from the love of God. And our first hymn is number 169, Good Christians All Rejoice and Sing. Let us pray. God, we have heard strange stories of an empty tomb and angelic messengers, and in our hearts we have wanted to believe. We have wanted to, the Easter news to be true. But now life crowds in around us, and the dismal voices of the real world tell us that it was all a hoax or a delusion born of wishful thinking. We respond by returning to normal, getting on with our lives as if nothing at all had happened. Raise us up, O oh God, as you raise Jesus from the grave, as you raise the first disciples from fear and despair. Help us be a people for whom Easter is not merely a day of the year, but a way of life. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were none of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. 
With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distrib distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. He sold the field that belonged to him, then, bought, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The Spirit is speaking to the church. We're going to sing number 121 of From More Voices. Everybody will sing um, the chorus, which is there, and then uh, there will be call and response for the verses. Uh, the choir will sing uh, the words, and then the, the uh, congregation will come in on, hey, now the tomb was empty. And we've done this before, so it's not new um, to the congregation. And as we sing, I'll ask the children to join Greg at the front of the church. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you come a little closer? 
and have a look at me. <laughs> there we go. Wow, what a nice orange coat. That's very close. Thank you. It's a sweater. Wow. Well, I've got a, I got a problem. I have a challenge, and I need your help. Do you think you'd be able to help me out here? Yeah. You think so? Yeah. You know that I have two really wonderful dogs? You didn't know that. I have two doggies. I do. You have two as well? Well, my dog, you have two as well? My dog, one is named Ben, and the other name is, J and the other name is Jingle. Jingle. Jingle and Ben. Now, I have a problem with them. I, yesterday, I gave Ben and Jingle one bone to share. And they didn't share very well. Guess what happened? And what do you think happened when the other one wanted to share? They didn't fight, but they growled at each other. No, they didn't attack me at all. So, so my problem is, I want them to share. And they're not sharing. Give them two bones, but that wouldn't be sharing, would it? I could cut the bone in half for them, but I want them to take the bone and one would nibble a little bit at it and then give it to the other and nibble. Do you think that's going to happen? No? You think it might get worse before it gets better if it's a sharing thing? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, you, well, in the Bible... Oh, you do. You have you share. That's good. Um, in the Bible which was read a little earlier, talked about a community that gathered together, the early Christians, and they said they shared everything. What do you think of that? Now, I'm wondering, what sort of things do we share? What's some, what are some things that we share? We share friends. We share food. Family. Uh, do we share the table? Yes. Yes. Do we share the Bible? Okay, share the Bible, the church, the songs. Do we share plates and cutlery at home? And books. We share books. We share jackets and hats. Anything else we share? Mittens and coats. And toys and boots. And boots. And, boots. And, and beds. There we go. Yeah. 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 Pardon? Sprinklers? Yeah, we share those. We run through them sometimes, don't we? Yes. Oxygen. Oxygen, that's right. The air. Air that we breathe. What about the um, what about the sun? Do we share the sun and the sky? And the moons? Moon? Now, is there one thing? Is there one thing, is, are there any things that we do not share? Yes. Your hair? Our face? Our internal organs? Sometimes, but sometimes we share organs as well. We donate organs, right? Our toothbrushes. Do you share toothbrushes? No. You don't share toothbrushes. Well, John shares, shares his toothbrush. <laughs> no, okay. So, you know, so there's some things that we share, but you know, one of the things that the early church, and that's a long time ago, and I think the church today, one of the really things that we do very well is that we do share. And we share different things. Here at Trinity, we share uh, uh, with the people up at Prince Street School. We give things there to the Salvation Army. Sometimes we have people who, who are having challenging times and they come visit us and they say, can you help us? And we share there as well. And you know, sharing is very important when we're with our friends or with our family or wherever we are. Because sharing is something I think that says something about who we are and it's very important. And I don't think they would have wrote about it in the Bible if it was an important thing to do. Share. Share. Share.
Yes. <laughs> Let's have a prayer together, and then I'm going to invite you to stand up, and we're going to invite all the big boys and girls to join in that very special, that very special prayer we call the Lord's Prayer, okay? Let's have a prayer first. Thank you for this day, God. Thank you for this day, God. For the sun. For the sun. For the moon. For the moon. For the stars. Stars. And for all the people in the world. And for all the people in the world. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For sharing all this with us. For sharing all this with us. We'll talk to you later, God. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up. <clears throat> and let's invite the big boys and girls to join in the Lord's Prayer with us. And would someone like to lead us in that prayer? You come on up. Yeah, there we go. Okay, there we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, 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 hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much. In the slide on the screen, you can see some members of the Trinity who were in a recent uh, production of The Wizard of Oz. You can, you can see Charlie Ross, and then wearing the crown is Kristen Thompson. And I, is that Grace Goche with the sweater on? Anyway, Grace was in the, in the production as well. A reading from the Gospel of according to John chapter 19 beginning at chapter 20 beginning at verse 19 when it was evening on that day the first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples were met ha had met were locked for fear of the Jews Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you after he said this he showed them his hands and his side then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. The week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. May we find life in the risen Christ.
Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <coughs> One of my favorite writers, Frederick Beekner, says that we really can't hear the stories of the Bible unless we hear them as stories about ourselves. We have to imagine our way into them. For example, when we hear the story of the prodigal son, the young man who wasted everything and then finally in desperation came home to his father, we have to be the prodigal. We have to come with all his anxiety, all his foreboding, all his worry that the door will be slammed in his face. And then we know the joy of welcome and reconciliation. Or we might imagine our way into the Father, the Father who here has a chance with his son again, the son whom he thought was lost forever. Now he has an opportunity to make a new beginning, to mend this relationship, which appeared broken beyond all recall. Or we might be the Canaanite woman whose child is demon-possessed, whose beloved little girl is being taken from her by forces that she can't understand, and certainly over which she has no power. And she comes with fear, and she comes with misapprehension to this strange healer from Galilee. And she knows that as a Gentile, she's likely to be driven away and to be scorned, to, told, to be told that she's of no account. And, and that's what happens at first. But she persists. And so her daughter is healed. And she hears from Jesus of Galilee, Woman, great is your faith. If we're going to hear this story, we have to be that woman. Is there any story easier for us to imagine our way into than the one that Gail just read? John's account of the evening of Easter Day. When the disciples are gathered together, they are behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. That's a strange statement. All of these people are themselves Jews. But they are afraid of the people who have arrested Jesus and handed him over to be crucified by the occupying power. And think of that little room where the men and the women are gathered together. The air is thick, it's hot. You can cut the tension with a knife. Every sound they hear could be the sound of someone coming to take them away, make them pay for their association uh, with Jesus of Nazareth, crucified, dead, and buried. There they are, the dominant factor for them, the central reality of that moment is fear. Then Jesus stands among them. Is this good news? Or, or is, it, is it something else? If you were Peter, it might not be good news. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, who cursed and swore and insisted, I never knew the man. Or if you're one of those who have run away, who have scattered at the first sign of danger, and who are now cringing in fear, 
What will Jesus say to you? Is this a vengeful spirit come back from the grave to settle accounts? Or if somehow Jesus really is alive and well, what recriminations will he have to make? What will he say to them because of the way they have behaved? Peace be with you, he says. Shalom. In other words, it's all right. It's all right. These are words intended to bring calm. These are words intended to bring healing. And Jesus shows them his hands and his side to let them know that the story continues that whatever this reality they are experiencing now may be, it is rooted in the one they have known, the teacher whom they have loved, the one who was crucified. Imagine the sense of relief. Not only because you're not being condemned for your failure, but because there he is, and with him suddenly your world is reborn, your dreams are reborn. You might dare to hope again. It's not a moment to be preserved. It's not something that they can cling to, because immediately, Jesus says, as my Father has sent me, so I send you. He breathes the life-giving spirit into them and tells them to go out into the world with this message of forgiveness. He gives them a great responsibility. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but I think it, it indicates that these people now these people in the light of Easter are intended to go and bring this news, not only of forgiveness, but also of accountability. They are to go and ask for a response to the news that they proclaim, to the reality of the Christ who lives. Of course, there's one who's not there. That's Thomas, sometimes known as Doubting Thomas, as if that were a moral failure on his part. I think Thomas wasn't there because he was one of the bravest of the lot. It was Thomas who, when Jesus left the wilderness of Jordan to go and help his friend Lazarus, who was dying in the village of Bethany, it was Thomas who said, let us go with him, that we may also die with him. And it was Thomas who said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And there's a boldness and an honesty in Thomas. Sometimes I can imagine myself Thomas the doubter, I'm not sure that I can easily imagine myself as this brave Thomas, this Thomas who won't settle for anything less than clarity. Probably Thomas isn't there because he's out scouting around. He's trying to find out what's happening. Are the authorities still looking for Jesus' people? Or maybe he's just trying to pick up the pieces of his life. In any event, when he hears the tale, when he hears the tale of Jesus standing among them, uh, he, he doesn't believe it. So I won't believe until I put my hands into his wounds. In other words, he wants the same experience that the other disciples have had. Thomas is not so much a doubter as he is a realist. 
He knows the limits of this world. He knows that the dead don't rise from the grave. He knows that if you follow Jesus, you're very likely going to have to die with him. He knows there's a lot about Jesus that's not easily understood. But he's not going to buy this one until he encounters the real thing, until he encounters the risen Christ. So again, the words, peace be with you. Beekner says that at that moment, when Thomas encounters Christ, he begins for the first time to see with his heart rather than with his head only or with his mind alone. Because the heart can see things, the heart can comprehend things uh, that the mind cannot. And think of your own experiences of falling in love. You brought your fiancé home for the first time, and your mother said, what do you see in him? What, what can you possibly see in that loser? But your heart saw, and you were head over heels in love. It's a bit like this for Thomas. At last his heart sees sees beyond the limitations of the grave, and sees beyond the stark reality of death. He sees the very power of God in this one who is there with him and with the others. My Lord and my God, he says. And so he too is, is commissioned. I said we need to imagine our way into this story. It's not difficult, is it? Fear is the main feature of our contemporary landscape. Be afraid. Be very afraid. What do you need to be afraid of? You need to be afraid of terrorists. They're all out to get us. And no sacrifice of liberty no sacrifice of civil society is too great, surely, to protect us from terror. You need to be afraid of uh, what will happen to the economy. You need to worry about that. You need to be in constant dread. You need to worry about climate change and its consequences. You need to be afraid of that. You may have seen an article by Gwyn Dyer in which he said that terrorism is really overrated as a threat. And then he was asked what really concerns him. His reply was climate change, climate change, climate change. Ironically, we're in a, a situation where we're being told that even though our addiction to fossil fuels is the major culprit in climate change, we can't let go of that addiction or that obsession. Why? Because it will be bad for the economy. So you see how one fear fuels another. So here we are, hunkered down behind closed doors. Or we wish we could close the doors of our minds against all of these things. And in the church, here we are behind closed doors. Uh, we wish that all of these things would go away. And so the temptation for us is to concern ourselves only about survival. We want to make this place as safe as possible, as comfortable as possible for the insiders for the club members, and maybe that will help us deal with our fear. Maybe we won't be so afraid if we can just accomplish this insulation from the world. But Jesus is never worried about getting people inside. 
getting people behind a closed door. He's always worried about sending people out. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And what do you do, what do you do when your resources are scarce? And you wonder if there's enough to go around? You ask, whom can we serve? How can we serve? We hear dire scenarios being um, put together about what might be in our not-too-distant future. Scarcity of food, scarcity of water, scarcity of living room, of, of, of living space. And how do we respond? If we respond in fear, then we try to have the largest army we try to have uh, the most efficient military capacity so that we can make a response and protect what is ours or what we insist is ours. Yet there is that reading from the Gospel of Acts, or from the Book of Acts, um, about the early church holding everything in common <clears throat> and where no one was in need. You talk about it being difficult to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I suspect that for most of us, it's difficult to believe not only that this type of sharing, this type of generosity ever happened, but that it can ever happen, that it is at, that it is at all possible. We hang on to our money, we hang on to the things that bring us comfort for dear life because of our fear of what would happen if we parted with any of this, if, if, we, if we really did share. And yet if there is a way out of this, of this prison of fear, surely it is in recognizing that the resources of this planet are something that we hold in common and that we cannot continue uh, to use and exploit an inordinate share of them for ourselves. Jesus says, don't be afraid. I bring you my peace. Think about Easter is if we really hear the stories, it empowers us to live in the world as we find it. The world we find can be a, a scary place. There's no doubt about that. It can freeze our souls. It can rob us of our courage and all our imagination. But Jesus says, peace. It's going to be all right. That's not just for that closed room. That's for when we go out, when we are sent as Jesus sends us. Earlier in the Gospel of John, he, he says to his disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace uh, do I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled neither let them be afraid. May Christ's peace, the deep peace of Easter, be with us all. Amen. And our hymn is number 168, The Risen Christ Who Walks on Wounded Feet.
Let us pray. This day, O oh God, comes to us like the light of Easter Day. As we are struggling, trying to grope our way out of a long, hard, dismal winter, we rejoice to be warmed by the spring sun. We rejoice to hear the sound of snow melting of waters beginning to stir again. And we look for signs of life coming from the land, and for crocuses blooming, and for trees beginning to come and bud, and for the sap rising in the maple groves. All of these things come to us and say to us, peace, it's going to be all right. You have not been abandoned. But the signs of nature cannot sustain us by themselves. And for there are other signs and other realities closing in on us. And so we need with our hearts to hear the words of peace. We need to know the peace that passes understanding the peace that the world cannot give and which the world cannot take away. We think of people who are living in war-torn zones of this world, and people who every day of their lives wonder if this will be their last, if they themselves will be victims or they will see the ones whom they love as become victims. We pray for them your peace, your deep shalom, God. We think of families who are torn apart by strife, and people who love each other and yet cannot live with each other, and in some cases come to hate each other, and so that the places where they live, their homes, are a kind of foretaste of hell. We pray for your peace and for your deep peace, God. We think of our congregations, places where people bring their anxiety, bring their anxiety about their own health, the health of those whom they love, bring their grief, and bring their fears at what is coming upon the world. We think of this congregation. We pray for your peace, God, and for your deep peace. And we pray that as we know your peace, we may be uh, like Joseph the Levite in the story in the book of Acts, who became Barnabas, a son of encouragement. May we be sons and daughters of encouragement for one another first of all, and then for this world, and so much in need of peace, so much in need of love, so much in need of healing, so much in need of courage and encouragement. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power, and we too will rise to new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. I was reading C.S. Lewis' book, Mere Christianity. He's talking about charity, about what Christians should give. He says, you always should give a bit more than you think you can, and that it should hurt a little bit uh, to be a Christian who gives. I know that this is not the only place where you give, but what you give here sustains this ministry of peace 
and hope, I invite you now to share. Your offering will be received. Let us pray. In the name of the wounded Christ, we offer these gifts, God. May they be a means of healing for many. May the act of giving generously be a way of healing for us. Amen. Christ is alive, hymn number 158.
Even so, I send you, he says, the risen Christ. Christ sends us to live resurrections, and to embody hope, and to embody love that cannot be defeated by hatred, and to bear the good news of forgiveness and new beginnings. May grace, mercy, and peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us this day and all days. Amen. Peace be with you. Mm -hmm.